Um, we're so glad for this opportunity of uh, presenting uh, some songs and maybe uh, a little story about Baba and the kids are going to play some songs. So uh, thank you everybody for joining and uh, um, I'm Mathu and my husband is Sunil is managing the tech part of the program today and uh, this is going to be just uh, songs of love for Baba. And the theme of, of the songs that I will be singing, not too many, um, I'll be singing songs about how important it is to remember Baba. And I think that is the essence of being with Baba is what he has told us is that we should love him, but it is very difficult for human beings to love the divine God. And so Baba's given us a very simple message. He says, if you can't love me, just remember me. Just remember me with every breath as often as you can. Um, so uh, the songs that I'm going to sing are all have the same common theme of uh, remembering Baba all the time. Um, so some of these songs actually are, um, are sung very often in the Pune Center. And I come from the Pune Center because there, uh, I was born and brought up in Pune. And uh, um, as a child, every Monday evening, I have been to the center. That was the place to be. If you were a Baba lover, and my family being a Baba lover family, what was expected of me was every Monday evening from 7 to 8.30, you are not to be seen anywhere else, but only at the center, at Baba Center. And so that's the kind of upbringing I had. Um, um, there was a, a, some of you may know Mr. Ramakrishnan, who was the chairman of Puna Center. And he would tell us beautiful stories every Monday evening from 7.30 to 8 would be his time when he would give a talk about Baba and there would be many stories he would talk about. And then at the end of his talk, he would always end his talk with constant remembrance is the only way um, that will lead us out of, uh, out of this difficult life of ours. And uh, remembering Baba is the only solution to all our problems. That's how he would end every speech. And um, so all my songs today are going to be about uh, trying to remember Baba with every breath, constantly. So, so Madhu, we are getting some feedback. Um, yes. So if someone else in your household is connected by audio, they may need to disconnect their audio. Oh, they need to disconnect. Okay. Yeah, we've set up two cameras because my children are going to perform later. So okay. I'll just have to mute the camera. Is it okay if they mute it? I think it's okay. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right. You have to disconnect the audio or turn down the speakers on the other end. Is it okay to start now? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Namohi Parabrahma Rupa Mehe Namohi Param Deva Deva Mehe Namohi Param Dharma Mulam Mehe Namohi Param Jnana Shakti Namohi Pita Matru Dhata Mehera Namohi Sakha Swami Dhata Namus Purti Dhata 
Was lovely, Madhu. Gail, you're you're muted. Sorry. Um, 
And uh, Ayush and Anika will be will now be playing a song. Um, it's it's called Amazing Grace. I'm just going to see if you're ready. Okay. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. That was fabulous. We had just had um, Ayush and Anika. Did I say that right? Um, I don't. If please correct me on their um, the pronunciation of their names. But what yeah. a wonderful um, duet! <laughs> and um, is there more from the Kumar family coming? Yeah. Or yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. You, you got muted. I'm sorry, my dear. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, again, you're muted. Jai Mehir Mehari Jai 
Thank you so much, Madhu. It looks like uh, we've got um, Annika up next. Uh, you know, I am. Um, I'm going. I was going to tell a short story, and then Anika. Oh, good, 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 yeah. good. Um, so this is a story that uh, Baba has himself told to the Mandali several times, many, many times. He has repeated the story, and um, the story goes such that there was a sultan, a emperor. And he was not, not just an ordinary emperor. He was a very advanced spiritual being. You could compare him to a perfect master or a saint. Now this uh, Sultan, this emperor had a slave and the slave's name was Ayaz. And the slave was also not an ordinary being. He was as perfect as his master. He was a very, spiritually advanced being. Now, um, in this emperor's court, there were many courtiers, many ministers who were very smart and intelligent people. And they were appointed as the courtiers or the ministers because of their expertise in various different matters that uh, were needed to run the kingdom. Uh, well, it so happened that uh, whenever there was a problem in the uh, kingdom and the king, uh, the sultan did seek, he did seek advice from all these courtiers and ministers about the matters in which they were experts. Well, every single time after he seeked everybody's opinion, he would ask his slave, Ayaz, Ayaz, what do you think about this matter? And Ayaz always had the final say in the matter. And it was as if Ayaz made the decision because the Sultan always listened to um, Ayaz's opinion. Well, the courtiers and the ministers, they, this happened for several years. And the courtiers and the ministers were getting envious of Ayaz and they were getting unhappy with the king. Because you know they thought they thought that they were the experts and smart and intelligent people, and why should the king listen to this slave of his? After all, he is a slave. Um, well, the emperor knew about what is happening here, and um, he decided to um, to make the ministers and courtiers. Um, he decided to give them an explanation. So one day um, he showed his, uh, the king used to wear a ring in his, on his finger all, at all times. It was a signet ring. And the purpose of this ring was that it was used as a seal for making the various decisions and the laws of the land. So whenever there was a new order or a law that needed to be passed, the king would imprint make an imprint of his ring on the document, which kind of authenticated the document or, or sealed the document. Well, one day the king raised his 
and, and he showed his ring to the courtiers, the ministers, and he said, this is my ring. It is the signature ring that I use for all the, um, uh, for sealing all the documents in the, um, um, uh, in the kingdom, all the important documents need to seal, uh, need this. And so he said, what do you think is the worth of this ring? What is the price of this ring? Now, of course, um, it looked like a very expensive ring with a lot of different gemstones and metals. And so all the courtiers and the um, ministers, they all gave their, expressed their opinions about what the worth of the ring could be. And um, there were jewelers that were invited from far lands who were experts in the matter of jewelry. They were invited and they were asked their opinions. And so everybody had their say. So the king listened to everybody. And then finally, he asked Ayaz, the slave, Ayaz, what do you think? What's the worth of this ring? And Ayaz replied, he said, master, as long as you are wearing the sling, as long as this ring is on your finger, it is priceless. You cannot put a price to it. As soon as you take off this ring and put it on the table in front of you, it becomes worthless. The story ends here. And then Baba explains to the Mandali that the plight of each of you, my lovers, my Mandali, is just like this ring. As long as you hold on to me, you hold on to my Dhamma, you are priceless. But no sooner that you leave my Dhamma, then you are worthless, no matter your greatness, no matter your wealth or knowledge you have. As long as you leave my dhaman, you become worthless. Um, so I think this was a very important story. It's a very important story for me personally, and Baba's told it several times. Um, so I think it's a very important story. Uh, Jai Baba, and I think now Anika is going to play her song, Jai Baba. I'd like to be playing a song called Witches Dance. Duke Ellington. It is a jazz tune.
Baba Kije. J Baba, now I'm going to be playing O Glory. Next, I will be playing See You Again by Charlie Puth. Papa, I think uh, we're done for today. Um, and we'll join you some other time again. Papa. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's just wonderful, Madhu, to have your, your families, your husband, Sunil, Ayush, and Anika um, to uh, play and talk about your love to, for Baba. Um, I know that you've been a wonderful um, addition to the Chapel Hill group. I know that you were very involved in the Denver group. Um, you, um, is that the first place that you were involved, besides home, Puna, besides yes. Puna, are those the two yeah, places? We, right, we, we came to Denver, uh, to Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, the first time we moved to the United States. And we lived there for a long time, maybe 13 years, 14 years, something like that. And then we've moved to Kerry, um, North Carolina. So those are the only two states we've lived in the United States. Well, I know you've um, hosted many, many um, times in the Chapel Hill group. And I have heard from others and from you that the Denver, you are very, very close 
to the people in the Denver group to the point that you had kind of had grandparents, <laughs> American mm -hmm. grandparents for your kids. Oh, um, yeah. There. So I know you were yeah. involved. It's yeah, wonderful we, to see your family and um, I hope you'll come back again. And um, I could absolutely feel the love with the children's playing, with your songs. Um, it was so heartwarming and it always is to see a family that loves Baba. So thanks. Um, we're all gonna give you a round of applause. Thank you so much for singing Thank for Baba so this morning. Much. Thank you, Jeff. Amber. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. I, I, I hope we have done better. I know we, next time we'll see more songs. Thank you. It's, it was lovely. Loving and lovely. Thank you. Jebaba. Jay Baba. Jebaba. Okay. Um, now we're going to switch gears here. Um, what a wonderful time that we've had with the Kumar family this morning. Um, the other part of our program was going to be some coming to Baba stories. And um, if you would like, just like we do, um, uh, Cassandra can, if anybody doesn't know how to use the uh, raise hands, Cassandra can put that up. But um, if you would like to share a piece of your Baba story, if you wanna share last week, your Baba story, um, we're eager to, uh, to see what you have brought to us um, that um, you would like us to know or that would help us on our path with Baba. I'm yeah, not seeing any hands, hands yet. Yeah, you can use the uh, reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's a raise hand there. And uh, also the uh, shortcuts I pasted into the chat window. So feel free. Well, I'm going to start um, with a short Baba story of mine. Um, it is my coming to Baba story, but um, before I get started, I would like to plant the seed. Um, last week in um, RT, um, at the end of RT, some of us were sharing what Baba is doing in our lives these days. And so it would be equally interesting to us to see um, where we've noticed Baba showing up, where uh, we didn't do it, Baba turned the key. Uh, so be thinking about something that's happened. If, if you don't feel like getting into your entire um, uh, coming to Baba story, there's also the option of uh, Baba shows, Baba never comes and he never goes. He's always here, he's always present. So um, share how you know that Baba's around. I call it when Baba winks at us, you know, I mean, he does little funny things and I'll realize, oh, Baba's here, little mischief. Um, so I, um, in about, well, in 1977, I was a sophomore at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. And that's in um, Guilford County and it's a Quaker school. And um, I was not raised as a Quaker, but I really enjoyed um, my four years um, being around. They're called friends. <laughs> that's, their fr that's how they refer to themselves as friends. So I enjoyed my friends um, at the Quaker school. And my second year, uh, that um, freshman year was the first time I was introduced to Meher Baba. And, um, it was a card on our um, on our wall, and it was just a little card right beside the um, the door. And my roommate Peg um, was a Baba follower, and I asked her about Baba, and um, she said a few words. And I looked at the card. At the time, I was a religion major, and I ultimately took eighteen religion courses. I didn't know that that was unusual to take twice as many as you needed to for your major. Um, but I did, and so um, I was very interested in Jesus, but I wasn't very interested in Eastern religion at all at the time. So what I know today is that Baba um, went into my ear. She I clearly knew who her Baba was. I saw the picture. Um, but it only stayed in my ear. And I'm gonna say 30 years later, um, I found myself in the office of Stephen Gage. Some of you may know, 
who is, uh, lives in Raleigh and is part of the Chapel Hill group. And uh, Stephen um, had come to Baba at Duke University where I grew up in Durham. Um, but as I asked him about the universe because he's my therapist, my psychotherapist. He was my um, therapist. And I asked, I had been seeing him for about three years and he was always saying the universe this and the universe that. So I asked him to tell me about the universe. Well, we spent, I spent 45 minutes listening to Stephen Gage tell me about Baba. And um, during that 45 minute time, it was instant recognition 30 years later. <laughs> um, and I do know that Baba was around in my life. Uh, I can now look back and see times that Baba was in my life. Um, but at that time, um, he, um, he looked around the office. There were two other Baba lovers, one of them in his, uh, um, that practices in the same practice as Dave Kravitz. Some of you know Kay and Dave. And I don't know who, whose office he went to because there are a couple of other Baba lovers too. Because I wanted to read something right away. I and mean, it was instant conviction. I just needed the tiniest little uh, turn for me to realize that this is the real deal. So he looked around and he came back with beams from Meher Baba. Well, most of us would not consider that the first book, the book, first book that would come to mind, but that was the only book there. So I took it home and I was going to see him in two weeks and I came back and I had read it three times. I could not make heads or tails of it but every single page, I knew it was true. And so I read, you know, I would read that and say, well, only God would know that. Well, only God would know that. And I went through every single page. So what I realized having taken 18 religion courses was I was way into the postgraduate stuff. I needed to go back to some more 101 type uh, material. And at the time I worked for, for NC State, so uh, he told me to go to their library, and I did, and Sherry R. had sent a number of different things, um, and so I started reading um, Lord Mayhair, which was there, and uh, so this was in November of 2000 nine or eight. Um, and so um, very shortly, it became early December and my dad um, sent me some money um, to buy things for myself for Christmas and for my boys, two boys. And um, so all of my money went to Sherry R. So I really became a big reader. And um, so in short, uh, that's my Baba story. I did a year and a week later, from when I first heard from Baba, I was, I found myself in Maribad. And it's quite the Baba story of how I uh, was able to go to Maribad. Um, I had a freshman in college uh, that semester. I went in December of, I guess, 2009, I think. And um, I had a freshman in college and a sophomore in high school. Uh, I was a single parent. Um, there was no way I could have done that, <laughs> but Baba to the rescue, um, as is, we see so often, um, my dad, um, said that he would give me, um, a certain amount of points that would be a one way of the leg. And, um, he had a lot of airline miles. My dad, uh, was an international tobacco buyer. So he had been to a hundred countries, um, during his time and he had been to India a number of times. They sell tobacco, he buys tobacco. Um, and so I, um, my dad felt like the cities in India were safer than the rural places. Well, Maribad qualifies as a rural place, but he just said, okay, um, you know, do, do what you think is best. And he had given my brother tickets, um, frequent flyer miles, to go from um, South Florida, the Palm Beach area to um, St. Louis to compete in a barefoot water skiing contest that he won. 
Um, and he placed number one. And so he was gonna, giving me the same thing he had given my brother. So I know that um, that it was just miraculous that I could um, get the time off because the previous summer, I had not been allowed to go with my son um, to his orientation to college. And I worked for the College of Education at NC State, but they didn't think that was important. So um, for me to be able to take two weeks off, again, quite close to Christmas, the students are gone. But Baba really showed up in some major ways. Um, it looks like Kippy might have to go out and hold on. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take her off, girl. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, another thing that happened uh, that connected me to the Baba community is um, about 10 days after I heard about Baba the first time, I had been reading a lot. Um, and I happened to go to the Carolina Designer Craftsman's Fair. Hold on, give me this. <laughs> Sorry, this is nuts. Um, I, went, I wanted to go to the Carolina Designer Craftsman Fair mm -hmm. because there was this um, potter, this jewelry maker, pottery um, phenomenon, phenomenal person and who happened to be the name of Tim Garvin. And I, um, I had a friend that sold some of his work in her shop in Durham where Tim and Cynthia um, live. And I, um, so I find myself in Raleigh at the Carolina Designer Crafts Fair and I found some, I had some, a special color of earrings that I had seen. Um, and there is a point to this. So um, I bought several things and when I went to check out, I saw I was going to make it out to the Blue Bus Studios. And I said, are you followers of Mayher Baba? Now how 10 days, I knew about the blue bus, only Baba knows, but I recognized that. And they said, yes, we are. And they said, well, who told you about Baba? And I said, Stephen Gage. And he said, oh yes, you know, we love Stephen. He's, you know, he's such an active part of our group. And um, so they asked me, did I know about the Monday night meeting that was held at Gil and Chitra Alvarado's house? And I said, no. So they gave me the phone number uh, and Monday um, after that weekend, I called um, Gil at the office and he returned my call. And starting that night, I have been a super active member of the Chapel Hill group. So all along, Baba just uh, paved the way. And I'll finally say, um, give you an example of Baba being active in my life before I knew about Baba. Um, I was raised um, in Durham, North Carolina. I was born there. And um, my mom and her family um, went to the Congregational Christian Church, which later became the United Church of Christ. It merged. And um, I, we were very active in the church. My dad was not active, but... Um, we were very active and the uh, minister's family lived next door to my grandparents. And so um, the minister's family was really young family, just like ours in the sense that kids, similar ages, um, they had at the time, they had a little sister before we had three, three in our family, but I was at their house all the time. And um, I, was always taken to Bible um, Bible school and Sunday school. And I was a very firm and firm believer by the time I was five. And so I know that, um, and that has always continued. And so when I came to Baba, um, I realized that this, you know, but Jesus has come again. And, um, I, so I could easily trust um, a higher power like Baba um, to believe to believe that he is the highest of the high. I, that was um, that was not a stretch, and um, 
my best friend now was a minister in the uh, Methodist church. And I think one of the reasons I'm her best friend is she said, you know, you don't expect anything different from me or my kids. Um, and she said, you don't know how unusual that is. And I feel like it was, you know, cause she's a wonderful best friend, Emma. Um, and so I, um, just the fact that I remember being at that house and that, you know, it was laundry day or the, the sink was dripping or there was, you know, stuff around, you know, it just wasn't perfect. And I just thought um, it really helped, has helped me in relationships going forward. So I am hopeful that some other people may want to either share something current or um, something about their Baba story. So I'm going to look and see, because I have not looked to see about any hands. Um, well, I'm going to... So but uh, somebody's going to volunteer. There we go. Well, Tina. All right. And we've got Paula as well after. So yeah, go ahead, Tina. Well, um, my story is a little different because uh, I came to Baba through the society and it was not a good experience. <coughs> I don't know if I should tell it here because... What's the society? What is that? Well, I'll explain. Oh. Um, <coughs> I think I need some water first. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Tina, since you said you're not sure if you should share it, how about since you've already said it was not a good experience, skip over and talk about when it started being a good experience. Pick no, up at the, the good experience thing, part. No, that's not okay. possible, Gail. Okay. Um, uh, I will talk about, I, I think Baba is everything. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I, the society was a cult, in my opinion. So, anyway, I came to Baba in college. <laughs> and I remember the moment when a friend of mine showed me a card with his picture. And I said, who's that? And he said, it's God. And I just accepted it. And um, I had been in the Self-Realization Fellowship and um, oh, I, uh, I really was not enjoying being in the Self-Realization Fellowship because um, you had to do all these exercises every morning and every week a, a lesson would come in the mail and uh, you would have to chat for 10 minutes, and then it was 20 minutes, and then it was 30 minutes, and then it was stand on your head, and then it was all these different yoga poses. And I was getting up earlier and earlier, and I was not enjoying it. <laughs> and so, so when this friend of mine showed me the picture of Baba, I said, um, well, what do you have to do? And he said, nothing sounded good to me because I was not enjoying the Self-Realization Fellowship. So then there were some meetings at this college near our college, this was in Pittsburgh, called Chatham College. And they, um, these girls were like the Meher Baba fan club. They were very enamored of Baba. They had pictures of him all over the walls of their room. and playing Begin the Begin and drinking 7-Up because it was his favorite drink. And, you know, I really caught the fever. <laughs> and so when they came, when I came to New York to become an actor, because I was in drama school at the time, and uh, they, I said, well, where can I go to pursue my interest in Baba? And someone gave me the address of this society for Meher Baba. And um, 
this was Harry Kenmore's group, but he was not really that present because he was ill and um, he had a serious disease. And anyway, this woman named Anna Rosa was running things. And um, so uh, she wanted, she, she did some good, I will say, because she got a lot of kids off drugs and, but then you became like her personal slave. And she decided that I needed to get a nine to five job and I needed to become a file clerk and not be an actor. And I was really resisting that because I was, I had trained for four years in college to be an actor. It's what I wanted to do. But she just kept at it. And, and she had me um, come over to her apartment and scrub her floors on my hands and knees. And, and she was like never satisfied. And, and the, at one point the sponge disintegrated and I threw it out because I had scrubbed the floor so many times. And I threw it out in the garbage can and she snatched it out of the garbage can and threw it in my face and said, what are you doing throwing out this sponge? Don't you know Baba is in this sponge? And um, so it went on from there. And then she, um, she decided that I should um, go to India because she said only the Mandali could beat this desire to become an actor out of me. And I didn't want to go because I wanted to be an actor. And so um, she kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. And she even got me a job as a file clerk and I was fired after the first day. I tried, but anyway, um, she said I, I needed to go to India and I was afraid that, you know, she'd get me over there and push me in the ga Ganges and I would drown. But, you know, she kept pestering me. So finally I asked my parents for the money and I joined their group. And so um, they had a chartered plane and uh, I was seated in between Anna Rosa and Harold Rudd. And Harold Rudd, I never met the man before, but for those of you who have met him, you know he was a real jokester and <laughs> a rascal. And so he leaned across me to Anna Rosa and he said, um, this is my new girlfriend. I'm leaving my wife and running away to India with her pointing to me. <laughs> and so um, she, of course, smoke came out of her ears. She believed him and she made me change seats. And then in um, Paris, when we changed planes, we, we got a, 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 a gallon of whiskey to take to the Mondeli. And I thought, wow, Mondeli are some kind of heavy drinkers. And so she had me hold it and while well, she looked for the money and suddenly it slipped out of my hands and it smashed all over the floor and I was drenched in whiskey for the rest of the trip. And uh, anyway, you know, that was that resulted in more tongue lashings from her. So we got to um, Ahmednagar and we took a bus from the uh, airport through the mountains and everything. And the whole time Anna Rosa is, um, you know, telling us, you're there for Baba, don't speak to anyone, don't talk to anyone, don't interact with anyone, just focus on Baba. So uh, when we got to the uh, Ashoka Hotel, all these Baba lovers came running out, Jay Baba, Jay Baba. And we looked straight ahead, we didn't react at all. And she was screaming at them, what are you sex maniacs? And uh, so um, I, I didn't want to talk to the Mondali at all because um, 
I was afraid they'd ask me what I did for a living, and if they found out um, I was an actor, according to her, they would kick me out on my ass. So um, I just was very quiet. I stayed in the back, and um, I, I almost made it. I almost made it through. And then the last day, as I was walking to the bus, I suddenly heard Erich calling to me. Oh, young lady, young lady, I have not talked to you. What is your name? And I said, uh, Tina. And he said, oh, very, very nice. And uh, what do you do? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I started to cry. I said, you know, well, I'm sorry to tell you, um, Erich, I'm an actor. And he said, oh, very, very nice, very, very nice. I, I said, but, but Anna Rosa told me Baba hated actors. And, and he said, no, 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 Baba had a theater company before he was the avatar and he, he, he managed all these actors and he loves the theater. And I said, but Anna Rosa said that I had to give up being an actor. And he just went like this. Every family has a crazy relative. <laughs> and uh, so that's basically it. Um, I'm leaving out some other parts to the story that were a bit more disturbing. But uh, I did not quit the acting profession, and um, I did become an actor, and that's kind of some of the high points of that story. Well, we're all grateful that you became an actor. You entertain us all the time. Thank you. You're such a I'm grateful. I, I, I did leave the society right after that trip to India, and... Um, I'm, I'm grateful that I got the insight from Erich to do that. Well, thank you, Tina. Um, that's a very different, but a wonderful and amazing Baba story. And it got you to Baba, it got you to India. And I know you went other times and uh, have yeah. been very, very, very active um, in um, your love for Baba since then. Yeah, so. yeah, I went again on my own in 1977 and I, I had uh, all my luggage lost by British Airways and um, I, I arrived in Vilo Vila, Vilo Vila with the clothes on my back and I, I told Amrit, she came out, she's like, um, you know, what happened? I said, you know, British Airways lost all my luggage, I just have the clothes in my back. And she goes, oh, how wonderful, you can buy all new clothes in my boutique. So she was very happy and she made me laugh. Well, that was terrific. Um, I really enjoyed your Baba story, and I know others did as well. It's um, it takes all kinds of experiences to get us to Baba. So you had a a very different one. I see that Paula has her Paula Roper has her hand up. Paula, would you like to go ahead and uh, share your story? Sure. <clears throat> One time Jeff asked me to share my story and I said no, and I felt bad about that ever since. So I thought I better, <laughs> I better step up. <clears throat> Actually, um, and I've thought about it since then, my story starts when I was a little kid. Um, I was raised Catholic and was very Catholic, but it didn't make any sense. And it was difficult. Um, so, but I love Jesus. So I held on to Jesus, but I was afraid. I really didn't think he loved me or liked me. So it was just, that was really difficult, but I always held on to him. And I love the blessed mother and I love the, and I still do. I still love the devotional aspects of the church, but you know, the rest of it I can definitely leave and do. Um, but it fed my soul in a way. 
So Baba was preparing me, but I loved him and I just wanted him. I wanted all those other people out of the way, you know, the saints and all that stuff. You know, I just wanted him. And that went on until for my life. And it was a, it was not an easy childhood at all because nothing anywhere made any sense. My family didn't make any sense. The church didn't make any sense. So um, anyway, so I'm, what was I? I was about 19, 18. I went to Mount St. Mary's. I grew up in San Diego and went to Mount St. Mary's and uh, did two years there. And um, after the second year, that's my dog who's saying, get me off the couch. Hang on just a sec. <laughs> he's 14 and he and he and he says and he says get get me where I want to be because <laughs> I can't do it so anyway um I'm I went for two years so I was about 20 years old and I was living in downtown LA across from the Doheny Mount St. Mary's and in a big house um Rosita was 76 and she rented out rooms to kids, you know, to people because her father had been an art collector all over the world and there were amazing things in her house that needed to be protected. And what had been the Beverly Hills of LA had become pretty much a ghetto across the street from the Mount, which is this incredible estate. So at one point, Jerry McLean, it was 69, and Jerry McLean moved into the basement and he told me about Baba. He had just come back from the last Darshan. And um, it, I, you know, it's like there, then what happened was, so there, was, that was in the spring. It was, it was probably April or May that he moved in and told me about Baba. I wound up going up to Marymount and we were, you know, helping Agnes, you know, I loved Agnes. I loved Agnes. She was great. She was such a straight shooter. She was just great. So she told me I ought to be a Franciscan. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't think so. I think I want to have some kids. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so I met her and loved her. I, you know, Baba just kind of slid me in just uh, really just like you know I'm on this slide and I just kind of uh by the following Baba's birthday in 70 um Jerry said well you know Baba's birthday they were having a celebration up at UCLA and I didn't do things like this by myself because I'm really shy and he, I, I thought oh okay I'll go with you and he said no no I'm going to the airport I'm going to meet the Mondali he was meeting Mergy and he was meeting Adi so I did, I went by myself, which was unusual. <clears throat> and what I remember is I was seeing picture, I was seeing, I couldn't understand anything Adi said, but that didn't make any difference. And I was watching films of Baba and he was bathing lepers. And somehow it was like, it was, I knew who he was. And I just looked at him and I said, I thought to my, I remember thinking clearly to myself, oh, you say you're the ancient one and that's your sense of humor. <laughs> so then what happened was I got the discourses after that and I got really, really sick. I had a viral pneumonia for months, like seven to nine months. And I left LA and went and lived at my mom's and she didn't, nobody believed I was sick and I was really sick. But during that time, I read the discourses and I'm so grateful to Baba because everything made sense. And I was so relieved that I wasn't going to die and go to hell forever <laughs> and be separated from my Jesus. So that pretty much is, is what happened. And after that, um, <clears throat> I remember when I was, I don't know, I think it was during that time when I met Agnes and she said that I could write, I mean, the Blessed Mother was somebody, she was my mother. And all of a sudden here was Mara and here were the Mondali. And I, I thought, you know, the way I'd been raised, I thought that they were not approachable. And Agnes said, yeah, you can write to them. And I was like, I can. So I did. 
and I and I wound up, you know, writing to Mara and in in some really critical times in my life too. And um, then eventually, by Baba's grace, I've been to India three times. Um, <clears throat> and literally by Baba's grace, because in the meantime, I met my husband who was a Catholic priest. And when I met him, I thought, I told him, I, I says, I, I've got a few things to tell you. <laughs> Boy, have I got some things to tell you. And he did, he became a, a Baba lover because he was searching. And, and he also was in the process of getting his dispensation from the Pope, which he actually got. Um, and Baba did that. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. That was uh, almost impossible, but Baba orchestrated that for him. And um, so then that, that moves into to his Baba story, but um, I guess that's it. It's like, it's not really very stunning, except one time I was moving to I decided I'm still really young and I just came to Baba and I was going to move from, I didn't know what to do. I've never known what to do with my life, you know, other than raising children and trying to be an artist. I've never known exactly what to do with my life. <laughs> so um, I was going to move from San Diego to Flagstaff and stay with some friends. And <clears throat> I was in the mountains outside. I packed up my little car and I put everything I owned in it and said goodbye to everybody. And I was in the mountains outside of San Diego and my car started to heat up. And so I pulled into a gas station and um, <clears throat> the guy looked at it and he said, there's nothing wrong with your car. It's like, well, okay. So as I'm pulling out of the gas station, Baba was right in front of me, really big hit in the, like in the don't worry, be happy picture. He's right in front of me and he's just pouring this love into me and he's shaking his head no. And I said, but Baba, <laughs> wait a minute here. So I got all the way to Gila Bend, which is quite a ways, probably about halfway there until I turned around <laughs> and went home because he was right, of course. So anyway, so he... um I, could, I couldn't do this life without him. He's just done it every step of the way. Anytime I needed anybody to help me, no matter what they look like or what they believed in, there's always been somebody to help along the way. And Baba's made sure of that. So I guess that's pretty much it. You know, he got me through illnesses. He's gotten me through, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do this without him. Um, none of us could. So I'm just grateful. I think that's it. <laughs> Jay Baba. Wow, Paula. Um, I've seen you on some um, Zoom, some of the Baba Zooms, but I certainly, you're in Oregon now, thereabouts, or where are you? No, I'm on Camino Island in Washington. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yeah, we so had Washington State. Okay. Yeah, another interesting thing Baba did with me though is so I came to Baba, but he kept me. It's really been weird because he kept me like to himself for years. It was, I got married and we lived in Flagstaff, and I would try to get. I knew, you know, of course I knew there was a Baba group in LA, but I couldn't find them, and I we would visit my family and, and my husband's family was in LA and my family was in San Diego. So when we'd go there, I would look, I would try to look them up and, and the phone book, everything. I couldn't find anybody. And it took some years. It took till I got to Washington. When I was in Washington, I wrote to box one, one Oh one. No, nobody's in Seattle. And that wasn't true. They just didn't know it, but there were Baba lovers here. So it was like, Okay, I kept trying, but I couldn't find anybody. Finally, I did when, uh, see, my son's 30, 42 now, and he was, I was pregnant with him when I found the, the Baba group here in Seattle. And it was a lovely, we were a very lively group. It was really fun. Um, but then it's like in the last, I've been out here on Camino Island for how many years? For 32 years. And it's like, Baba picked me up and threw me way out into the country. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like, well, okay. 
I, you know, it's like, like in Tina's story, you know, everybody plays their part and we are put, we really are put where he wants us to be because my whole life has just been kind of miraculous. It's like, um, anytime I try to plan anything or get, um, get some things together for myself, um, it all fell apart quickly. Bubba doesn't, he doesn't mess around. <laughs> so anyway, it's just kind of been a life of kind of, I feel like I've been fumbling around for a long time, but anyway, at least I'm fumbling with Baba. <laughs> and I got to meet Mara. I got to meet, I mean, and she's just, um, I didn't just get to meet her. I got to be with her and, and, and feel her and have her, um, just pay attention in the, in, the, in the way only Mara can pay attention. And she did. I was in the middle of a crisis with my oldest son and I was in the middle of writing a letter to Mara when that happened, when I found out what was going on and it was very serious. And I thought, I can't write this to Mara. So I wrote it to Mara, who I was also really close to. And when I went to India, Mara said, I didn't get that letter, Mara got it. So that's who it was supposed to go to. And, you know, things, so they, they're our guiding light, that's for sure. Yeah, and she's our mother. So, okay, well, that's something. <laughs> Jay Baba. Paula, that was fabulous, as was Tina's. And I enjoyed sharing my story, and that was, um, the purpose is that we'd start off with a, a Baba family and get some um, good vibes and good music and um, a good Indian family. Um, is there anyone else, last I checked, um, is there anyone else who would like to share their Baba sh story? We've got some more time, but we could, we've been running about an hour, so we could also um, call it. So let me know. What do you think? Well, I want to thank Mayher Baba for this day. Um, the stories have been very, very meaningful to me. Um, the music that, it, the music made me think about um, people playing for Baba. Those kids were playing for Baba. You know, yeah, they were playing for us, but it was an opportunity to play for Baba. And um, uh, the beautiful singing that uh, we got from um, Madhu was wonderful, and I want to thank everybody, Baba first, but the whole Baba community and uh, Baba Zoom for bringing us together uh, once again, and I hope you, I think it's still Saturday everywhere, um, but um, I hope you have a good weekend and uh, send blessings out, and we will see you on another Baba Zoom call. Thank you. Uh, Jay Baba, thank you, Gail. Jay Baba. So Betty had her. Yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. Okay. Um, I, fortunately, we've got our um, our Angela, who is our angel. She can uh, work that out. But Betty, I was so hoping to hear your story. That would be wonderful. I have wondered about your story because I know um, some things about the Berkeley Group, and I don't know if that's your story. So eager to hear. Uh, are uh, is, does this really end at nine? Is that uh, how you work? Oh no, no. It it. Oh. Um, I'm gonna need to leave at at twelve, which is nine your time. But oh, okay. I don't All know, right. um, Cassandra. What's your situation? Oh well, I guess Betty, if you stay on, I can stay. On. I'll be my own. You can tell her own story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you when you start to say the goodbyes, I thought, no, wait a minute. <laughs> We've only just begun here. <laughs> <laughs> um let's see uh where to start uh i uh was i golly uh i was newly divorced with a four-year-old mm -hmm. and uh needed a job and um it was a local publishing company that um, 
uh, serendipity. I just applied to and and got the job. It was a, a really neat place. It was right across the street from Joan Baez's commune in California, up up in the hill, uh, the foothills of uh, right near Stanford University. Um, I uh, it was oh, it was a wonderful job. Fun people and. Uh, uh, a particularly lively person in the art department was a woman named Kathy Wiederholt. This was, well, it was 68, 69. And um, she, uh, she had gotten, um, uh, she, uh, she'd gotten to know the Sufi group, the Sufi, Sufism Reoriented in San Francisco. And she would come back and tell us, uh, about uh, about Baba and about um, I remember on Silence Day we all we all joined in we all or many of us did we wrote notes and it was kind of a game it was fun and uh, and this was in July and then she, then the um, the uh, the the adventure was that she was she was gonna go to the darshan with them in in uh, I think it was April that they went I'm not sure about that but so and we thought that was exciting uh, I mean we were we weren't it was just fun we were we weren't taking any of it too seriously but uh, uh, so well, well there's so many stories but one is that uh, she had to make payments and in installments and the last installment she didn't have and there was a deadline of I don't know, f uh, uh, I think five o'clock that day where she, um, you know what, this is becoming her story, but uh, <laughs> so it's my story too. She, uh, she, uh, she didn't have it. And, and, uh, oh, and my good friend, Laurel Keeley, who uh, uh, was also a Sufi, she, and worked with us, uh, she was, t uh, she, uh, she said, I, I, uh, I couldn't stand it. She said, I wasn't there because, uh, because I had by then gone off hitchhiking <laughs> to Mexico with a boyfriend. But, I, but, uh, but before I left, I sewed Kathy a dress and I, I embroidered a pink Baba dress for Kathy. I don't know if she ever wore it, uh, but she, uh, anyway, that was my sort of contribution. I also told her if she needed money, I'd give her some, but then I wasn't there. So anyway, Laurel, uh, it was the day that she needed her her, insta her money, her last installment. Laurel uh, said she couldn't stand it, ran home to her little cabin in the woods in La Honda, and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, her tax return check was there. And so she ran back and gave, short story, long story short, Kathy had the money, she ran to the city and Kathy went off to India, um, and um, uh, so in the meantime, I was living a pretty wild. My my our son was with his dad, who's Dave. Dave and I were married back in <laughs> back in the sixty four, and then divorced. We were we were we really weren't old or mature enough to <clears throat> to. I, I'm glad to say, Baba. Help, uh, help with us. With so that, ten years later, we remarried. But at the time, uh, I was off in in Mexico with a boyfriend, and um, wow, well, uh, so I didn't, uh, I I wasn't there to hear about Kathy's trip to India. Uh, but that this place, Sullivan's, where we worked was uh, a real nucleus for Baba lovers, for, uh, most of them from Stanford University. Uh, several, many, Heather worked there for a while, uh, another friend, Renee Busan, many, many Baba lovers came through this place. For some, it's defunct and the owner had no clue, there was no connection there, but, but a, a lot of us found out about Baba through this place. Uh, and, and there was a Baba group that, that sort of formed at the university where we were all part of. Um, you know, I think at this point, I'm gonna go back to uh, myself. I guess back, um, uh, when I, my 
first experience for a spiritual experience happened when I was uh, little I I, um, <clears throat> I uh, and I'm pretty sure it was 52 spring summer of 52 uh, and I and and actual oh, let's see uh, I only th I, I thought of it because much later in life I I uh, basically heard a voice that said, remember when you were six. So, and at that time, uh, I had to have been about six. It was before my my seventh birthday. I, uh, I, I'm sorry to be jumpy all over the place here. I, I was laying outside on the front lawn at night with my cat. I've always loved cats. Uh, Smokey. And it was night. It was, you know, past my bedtime I was just laying on the lawn with my cat Smokey and looking up at the sky and there was just this and bliss I was just in bliss just looking at the sky uh, and finally my mom opened the door and said hey what are you doing I think I'm in his bed and I was like oh God. I knew I had to I had to leave this incredible experience and I was, it was just hard. It was really hard to leave, uh, to, but that was what I had to do. Kind of come back and I didn't know if I was out of my body or what, but that was, that was, and that I, it had to be 52 and, and it was, and it was spring or summer because it was, uh, it was warm. I was outside laying in the grass. So I like to think that that was Baba <laughs> saying hello. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, so I, I, oh yeah, I, I had a time in my young life, I didn't think much about it or, you know, it just happened, <laughs> but then in, uh, in my teens, uh, or preteens, I got, I, I became a, a, a born again, uh, lover of Jesus. I, uh, I went to a Christian church camp and had a great, con you know, conversion experience with tears. And, uh, it, uh, and that was my life was Jesus, uh, uh, for, um, I don't know, along about high school, uh, I began to get really turned off to their uh, conservative political, it was anti-communist then, John Birch. Uh, I, 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 and I began to get very sophisticated. <laughs> so any base bottom line was, I, I uh, oh, I joined the Quakers, that's right. We had a, we had a great uh, Quaker meeting in Palo Alto, uh, and which was much more, you know, politically and really intellectually in line with who I was at that time. Uh, so and Dave, Dave and I, Dave and I met when I was in high school. We both we both did folk dancing, and we loved that that Quaker meeting. It was wonderful. But uh, but you know, then the sixties came along. I was in I was in college, and and uh, we we lived in the same town as the Grateful Dead. We, so uh, it was it was very easy to get swept up in that that druggy culture. We uh, we were. We weren't big drug people, not that we did take drugs, but not, I mean, it was never real important to me. It was something to do because your friends were doing it. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was, I went to college and for one year at San Francisco State and, and by then, uh, God or Jesus, I, the, we, we didn't, we weren't particularly spiritually inclined. I. Um, when I, um, but by the end of that year, I was pregnant, and that was oh boy, that was not uh, what I had anticipated, and it, it life got kind of hard at that point. I mean, we we married and and I had a baby. I just wasn't I was not ready to be a good mom. I I think I had, and in, in spite of our inadequacies our our son is just a wonderful guy he, he kind of went along with the hippie life with 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 us but it wasn't long before Dave and I divorced and so there I was alone with this lovely kid um and 
And so for about 10 years, I, I lived the hippie life, lived in a commune in Canada, had, had a lot of fun, but, but uh, was not very serious about life. And um, uh, so I, I, just, I got to the point probably in the 70s when I got it, it, it I got pretty disillusioned with with where I was and uh, the commune fell apart and uh, so there my son banks we we I, I got I got to the point where I oh oh and working for working for that place Sullivan's was part of this time and so I knew about Baba I didn't think it was my path, um, but at, at this time where I was deeply, deeply disillusioned and I had had an abortion and uh, I, I figured, you know, you really can't, <laughs> that was it, that was the bottom, that I, I really had to be much more serious about life. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Hmm. So, uh, 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 it was kind. Of, it was a time of penance, is what it was, um, and I thought very seriously about the the re religious groups that I knew about, and Baba just came out on top. It was it was a pretty calculated. The people I knew, most of whom were Sufis, or no, many of whom were Sufis. Because that's that that was the group in the Bay Area that I knew that who had met Baba, that uh, so that I thought I was gonna come home and straighten up <laughs> and uh, uh, and be a Sufi. That's what I thought. So I came home to my dear parents who just they lived in a little one bedroom house in Palo Alto, uh, uh, and of course took us back in and. Actually, we had some wonderful years and kind of mended a, a pretty difficult relationship. They had given up on me. Um, it was was very sweet, very sweet. My deaf parents, I do sign language at our little groups. Um, and uh, that. so anyway, I came home, thanks, and I lived with them for four years. And then wouldn't you know, Dave came back from, he had had a, he was a dad, he had two other kids, he had had a relationship that had also fallen through. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, by now I was working in publishing and he, uh, and I thought, oh, I'm not, you know, I wasn't at all sure about getting back together with him. So I, I uh, but we, um, we found a, um, I'm not taking too much time. I said, wait, we found a counselor <clears throat> who, uh, in the Sufi group, who Baba had said, told to be to do counseling. So I thought, well, that's pretty good. So we um, we did some counseling, and and <laughs> and I felt like it was at that juncture that I felt like I I either I was not going to become a Sufi. I, I remember I went and talked to Lud. We we did. We both did to Lud Dimple, because he would do that. He would, he was what was called a preceptor and he advised, would advise people. And he said, I said, I'm, uh, he said, you know, sometimes you want to sweep things under the rug and they don't stay swept. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so uh, bottom line was Dave and I remarried after sort of much more careful looking at our situation and uh, um, and I I I felt I knew that I, I could not I had that was when I chose not that uh, that wasn't my path I I, I felt that you had to be um, <clears throat> you couldn't because you couldn't marry outside of the group I guess is I, that may not quite be true I know Max has a soupy anyway uh, but that was my sense of it I had to make a choice, and that was the choice I made. So, <clears throat> sorry, long, uh, long story. Uh, uh, and so we married again in '76, and uh, went to India in 
80, all of us family went to, in, to India in 87. And, uh, and yeah. part of my go, wanting to go in 87, because I knew this, by then there was the Sufi controversy, I guess you'd say, which, um, which absolutely agonized me. I just was, I couldn't believe that we, you know, this family, we had been a family, all of our groups. I mean, I know they were different, different, uh, uh, <clears throat> differences, differences, but I still felt that we were all a family in Baba. And uh, I, oh, I, so part of my wanting to go at that time was, I knew they were gonna be there with this very controversial immersion, um, Jim Mackay. But I figured, I want to see this. I want to. <laughs> and the Mandali were incredibly warm and wonderful and welcoming to everybody there. There was that, uh, which made me so happy. Uh, um, and, um, but, gosh, I, <clears throat> my most profound ex experience in India happened at that time. I went, um, uh, uh, I, I was, and some people knew that I was all torn up about this situation, that, the, that there was this dissension between Sufis and, and, and the rest of us, I guess you'd say. And, uh, and uh, I was, I, I remember right before I went into Baba's room, Casey and uh, was it Dave? No, Casey came up to me and said, "You know, uh, uh, I know you're having this trouble about uh, uh, Sufism, not Sufism." And she said, "You know that that picture of Baba, the um, at Baba Baba Maleshwar where he's standing over." She she said, "It's it's um, uh, he's standing at the confluence of two rivers, one which goes directly to the sea and the other which kind of meanders. And he, she said, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the example of what, of what this issue is, her, her feeling that, you know, the Sufis were meandering and, um, and that a, a straight course to Baba was it, was the best course. And I told her, I said, well, Casey, how do you know? How do you know who, which group is right? I, uh, um, so then I um, then I went into uh, Baba's room, and it happened for some reason. I was the only one there. There were all these people at Marizad, but I was the only one there. And uh, I felt his presence overwhelmingly as soon as I entered the door. Uh, and I went and bowed down at his bed, and I had this strong impulse to turn around, look out the window, TV window, look out the window. Uh, I thought, what, you bowed down to Baba's bed, and I'm going to turn my back and look out the window? I thought that was just weird, and I I kind of hung on for a bit, but I finally, you know, I was, I did. Uh, and then Devana comes in with a group of people, a small group, and she said, she was showing them around, and she said, First thing she did was she said, see this, Baba said this was his TV window. She, he looked out on the world. And <laughs> I thought, oh, okay. And then the next thing she pointed out was the picture of Baba and Mahabaleshwar that's in his room. And she said, and this picture, she said, you know, he has this, there's this river, the straight course and the meandering river. And <laughs> oh, and then the next thing she pointed out was this, this beautiful Hafiz painting as, uh, and I can't remember a word of it, but basically it's, it's you know, what the master says, do it. Accept <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> what the master says. Not, uh, I, I think you probably all know it and I, it's completely left my mind, but it, it, it's not, uh, it's not as you do, you, uh, the master, <laughs> except what the master says, I guess is what it is. That's what I'm, I apologize for blanking. I know which one you mean, um, but I can't think of it right I, now either. <laughs> <laughs> getting a fortunate slave. Yes. yes. Getting, getting a fortunate, fortunate slave. slave. You know, <laughs> uh, 
and I was just absolutely blown away by the <laughs> that truly it was probably my most profound Baba experience. So I I'm that 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 there's <laughs> not much more to say after that. <laughs> well thank you, Betty. That but, was yeah. good. Yeah. That was wonderful. I've always wondered about your story. I didn't know you were a hippie. Oh, totally. <laughs> oh, yeah. I could have guessed, Dr I guess. Drug, sex, and rock and roll, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, and I spent a great many years, truly, in penance. I, I hope I... <laughs> we'll see. I'll get to work. Well, it turned out pretty good. It turned out pretty good. We love you. <laughs> So, um, Betty, I, I need to leave. What do you think, folks? Should we st still record, or are there some people who would rather to give their tell their story after uh, without recording? Because Tina has her hand up. And yeah. She already told her story. Yeah, but I, I left out some important points. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Can I just say, I think we should do this regularly, maybe monthly or something. I, I know there are more Baba stories out there. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's my suggestion. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Don't have to do it all. Um, I, I don't care if you record me. I've already been recorded in, well, by Robin Vogel. Okay, I need to go. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll keep going. All yeah. right, very good. Well, J. Baba, everybody, enjoy. Bye, Cassandra. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to add um, some, the climactic moment I left out of my story <laughs> when I was in India with the society um, one day I came up to the Samadhi and I saw Anna Rosa and this boy in this very heated argument and suddenly she started physically attacking him and beating him and pummeling him and screaming at him right outside the Samadhi, if you can imagine. And then she had, she called some of the men in the group and they dragged him down the hill and threw him in a tonga and locked him up at the Ashoka Hotel. And the Mandali were trying to get him out of there, but she was adamant. She, she, I later found out that um, she uh, thought he was going to, he, he said he wanted to stay in India after the group went back and he was a young kid and she was afraid his parents would sue her and that's why she did it and that's why Eric Eric told me every family has a crazy relative and um, anyway when I got back to the US I wrote her this letter and I said, um, I put $50 check in. I said, um, you know, thanks for bringing to India, me to India, but I'm leaving this society. Good luck. <laughs> and uh, she wrote this 10 page letter back with the check torn up into little bitty pieces and just accused me of all these things like being a sloppy housekeeper. She'd never been to my house. Anyway, um, and then she started calling my house in the middle of the night and saying she was going to come and get me. And, and the thing was that she always got my roommate, who was not a Baba lover. And her roommate finally said, who is this woman who's waking me up all the time in the middle of the night? And I told her and I said she lives on 72nd. So the next time Anna Rosa called, my roommate said, Anna Rosa, I know who you are. I know where you live, and I'm sending the police if you don't stop. And that's the only way that we got her to stop. But um, after that, I, I went to Meher Baba House in the village, and it was, you know, very loose and new agey and a bunch of hippies. and. It was just much more me. And so it was quite a journey, though, getting out of the society. But I never looked back. And gradually, more and more people left until she was only left with herself and Ira Goodman in the end. 
you know, Tony Paternini also was in that group, and he he yeah. also, he said he called it a cult. It's a yeah. shame. I mean, Harry was so dearly loved by Baba, but it went. Asleep. Well, he was blind, and he didn't hear well, and so you know everything went through her, and but besides which he had very serious cancer by the time I got there. And he died shortly after I got there. So she she, she had some mental issues for sure. Anybody else inspired to talk? <clears throat> Well, maybe we should just call it a day and but wow i i i would sure like to hear more stories maybe maybe we can schedule this good idea betty regularly maybe maybe monthly yeah we could find a slot um, you know tina um i i'm i kind of met anna rosa the, the society was there when i was there in india in 86 for the first time <laughs> And, and that was quite an experience. Um, but something that I noticed, I was on the veranda and she was, and I really wanted Mary's attention, but I was very, very shy and kind of, you know, scared and stuff. But anyway, but Anna Rosa was telling a story about her childhood and how she had been, um, she, how this other there, there were two, she was not, she was living with an aunt or somebody and that aunt had a daughter about her age and all her affection and attention went to that daughter and not to Anna Rosa. Yeah. And I just remember Mara and how she listened so carefully because I really wanted some attention and I thought, well, this person really needed Mara's attention and she did at that moment. And Mara just said, that hurts the heart of a child. Oh, that's so sweet. I know. And it was like, it was really cool. And then everybody left the veranda and then I got to have my own private time with Mara. <laughs> Baba does things that way, you know? <laughs> it yeah. was really incredible. Yeah. Amazing. But it kind of, it kind of gives you an insight. It's like everybody plays their part and comes from, you know, it, you, those kinds of, cra that craziness comes from, a psychologist said once, he says, you know, when somebody has those behaviors, it comes from somewhere. Oh, it doesn't yeah. come out of nowhere. We all have our sanskaras and we play our part. Yeah. And it got you to Baba. <laughs> and it got you to Eric who said, no, 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 that's not right. <laughs> I, yeah, I was inches away from a clean getaway. <laughs> when he called my name and, you know, asked me what was going on, I had to admit the truth of my horrible profession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, and the, the funny part was that when she was trying to get me to give up being an actor, one day she called me back and she said, you know, people say I look like Ida Lupino. Do you think I could make it in show business? <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Does the society <laughs> still exist? No, no. It, oh. When she died, uh, it was just her and Ira Goodman. And he, I, I didn't, he moved to Florida and married somebody and... Is that yeah. Lenita's husband, Ira, or different? No, no, no. Um, that was Ira Gross. Okay. This was Ira Goodman, who's Peter Goodman's uncle. Oh, I'll be darn. <laughs> He's, um, he has Asperger's. He's a very sweet man. <laughs> but he remained devoted to her to the end. Interesting. I love you. Know, everybody. I was wondering. Everybody you plays their part. part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I was a little girl and 
there was this lead soprano in our church and when she would sing she would go into religious ecstasy and her eyes would roll out of her head and and people made fun of her but i was very attracted to that and i wanted that <laughs> you know and it, yeah did you know that person very well um no i didn't but um we we sang this song the holy city where all uh, the streets were paved with gold and all who would white might enter and no one was denied and uh -huh. that wasn't the reality in my town because it was, there were uh -huh. no black people there were no, no ethnic minorities and so i always longed to go to that holy city and be yes. like you know the the uh -huh. uh, part of that community and i think that um Marizah, Maribad is the holy city. Yeah. Because all who heard right enter and no one is denied. Unless it's COVID times. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then Baba says, just come in your heart. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, as for nowadays, it's very difficult for me. To feel him. I so you really meant it when you said your days in choir were very, very special to you, Tina. I know you often yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, because I didn't get along with my parents. They were uh, real extreme right wingers. Yeah. And they didn't like anybody who wasn't <laughs> a white Anglo Saxon product. <laughs> <laughs> they were very prejudiced and <laughs> I just always wanted to go to that holy city where all who would might enter and no one was denied. Do you, you know, know that, a of, Paula? A lot of Baba lovers, we kind of wonder how we got matched up with who we got matched up with. <laughs> yeah, Jane Brown told me that um, somebody, one of the Mondali said that um, Baba had told them after... Um, World War II in the baby boom generation, he ran out of good matches, so he just <laughs> to, you know, randomly give people to others who might not be best match. I don't know, but then he drew us to himself, and in that way, too, he also connected our families with him. That's true. You know, this. so he you know, we really don't know much of anything. We're long for the ride. Yeah, I'm just trying to hold on. That's right, that's right. And it is hard sometimes. I tell Baba when I can't find him. Sometimes I can't, I can't find you. And I really, really miss him. You know, it's that, I remember when I was raising my kids, I really felt like with my husband and my kids, like anything I did, I was doing it for Baba in them. And it's just, it got, the older I got, it harder to, got harder to remember, but it's true. It's like, that really is the truth. Everything we do is, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, so all we do is do our best. I, I mean, I, my yeah. son's not speaking to me now. And he's writing me these very angry emails telling me I was a terrible parent. And I think I was always there for him, but he doesn't see it that way. Aww. Well, this is your challenge, isn't it, Tina? Yeah. You know, it's. I was with my, my kids last night and my son and his girlfriend and her mother. And what we were talking about was the difference in the stories that the parents have and that the children's have <laughs> and those stories are, are really different <laughs> yeah well my parents thought they did really a good job because they I had every material advantage uh, I, I they paid for everything they were wealthy and you know that's what they thought it was to be a good parent yeah they did it took me till I was in my 30s to understand that my mom and dad gave me everything they had and they didn't have everything I needed and they didn't know what I needed. 
Um, and it wasn't, that's what, and then somebody reminded me that that was nobody's fault. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't my fault. It's just the way it is. And mm -hmm. as a parent, I wanted to give everything, everything to my kids. I don't have everything to give to my kids. You know, I tried and my oldest son gave me hit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just don't know what my son's complaints are because in my mind, I've always been there for him, but. I know. He just, he's just very angry. Yeah, sometimes people get stuck in their stories and then you wonder how that serves them. Right. I do wonder that because mm -hmm. I've bailed him out so many times and he's been in trouble with the law and things like that. And mm -hmm. he just thinks everything's my fault. So. Well, yeah, that's, that's his to work out. You know, you can be responsible. Yeah. Yeah. You do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so intrigued, Paula, by the fact that you married a priest, an ex-priest. Yeah. Were, did he leave because of his relationship with you? or was No. He, go, do you no. Was on his way out anyway? He was planning on, for it took, Bill was one of the most thoughtful, thorough persons. I think you met him. No. That, oh, you didn't? Yeah, because he was down at Scott's Mill some, at different times. Um yeah, he never did anything without a lot of thought going into it. And so there was a priest in Rome. It, Bill was a Claritian, and, uh, which is a missionary order. And uh, he, the way he was put, to, Bob knew how he was put together. And when he made a promise, that was it. And so he, in his heart, he needed to be released from that vow the way he made that vow so it took years for this priest in rome working on his dispensation which is called a rescript so then and during that time he met me and there were a lot of reasons for his his leaving he was he, the bible wasn't doing it for him anymore he was a seeker and uh then when i met him i did tell him about baba and it took him a while but um, he fell. <laughs> he fell in love with him and with Mira. Are you uh, married to him? My husband passed away. Oh. Did you yeah. stay together all those years that you were married? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We had two sons. And he, but what happened was um, he got his dispensation. I got a call. It was after we were together. I mean, we, we married each other three times. We married each other. Then we got married by the justice of the peace. Then we had Christian. Then we got married in the church. <laughs> we kind of got married a lot. <laughs> and But he got his dispensation. And the thing that Baba did was he got his dispensation from Pope Paul VI. He died. Then there was John the I. He died or was murdered or whatever happened to him. And then there was John Paul II. And this was a very short period of a short time frame. And uh, by the time when John Paul II got in, he put a moratorium on dispensations. Oh. So we knew that he, would, he wasn't going to give them. So he, Baba made sure that Bill got his because he needed it. Other people probably didn't need that, but he did. So, and then um, with him, uh we went to he he drove for metro in seattle he was a flight instructor he had been a teacher he had been a counselor he'd been all these things but it was you know it was almost like he took a vow of poverty and i was going to be a nun and baba took it seriously <laughs> <laughs> So it was always a struggle, but he drove for Metro in Seattle for 12 years. But so, he, so I used to think about it and I thought, here's this person who's got Baba's picture and the discourses and all this, because he would do all this, you know, on his breaks and stuff. And he's transporting all these people all over everywhere, you know, from here to there. It was just interesting. And 
at one point, Joyce Jeffrey had um, like the prasad from the East West gathering that Baba put aside. And she, there was not hardly any left. It was like, we got a molecule of it. I was pregnant with Gabriel. So Christian and Bill and myself went and she would put this little tiny piece of prasad on the end of a toothpick. I got two doses, one for me and one for Gabriel because he was inside of me. And after that, Bill is completely for Baba. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My husband really took to him too. We went to India together, we took our son. He met the Mandali. I mean, what greater gift could I have given him? Right, right. Yeah, a lot of the Mandali, Bill got, he was he was not well enough. We didn't have the money. He could. He never got to India, but a friend of ours helped us get to Myrtle Beach. And it was incredible. What Baba gave us was incredible because it was on my husband's birthday. And I was really worried about his birthday. I was like, what was I going to do, you know? And that whole time, it was like one of the celebrations for Baba's, one of Baba's accidents or something. It was a big celebration. And then Darwin had been really sick. But on my husband's birthday, he came out and, and Baba's house was open. So we got to do that. We got to, and I wondered, how was I going to, I didn't have to do anything. We went to lunch with Darwin. And so there was cake and there was a good meal and there was, you know, all this fellowship with Darwin. And then that evening, um, uh, there was a concert and, and God, Jerry Watson was a pilot and so was my husband and they really hit it off. Mm. And, um, it, I mean, it was magical what Baba did. It was like the best birthday of his life. <laughs> it was so wonderful. Nice. Yeah. So Baba, you know, he, he's, he really does give us our heart's desire. Mm. So that's part of Bill's story. Yeah, well, I asked Baba for a child, and this is what he gave me. Well, the story's not over yet, Tina. Uh-uh. And we're all just working it out. And your son needs, he'll grow up. He's not grown up yet. It doesn't matter how old he is. He's not grown up yet. Until you can take responsibility for yourself, you know, and, and, and it, it, you know, they're young. Yeah. Well, he just had a baby and he, his wife just had a baby and, and he won't let me see him. That, that hurts your heart. Yeah. I mean, it does. Yeah. I don't think he should use the kid as a paw, but that's his weapon. Well, you just need to take care of you, of Tina. Yeah. I, the wife has FaceTime calls with me and I get to see the baby that way. So. Oh, that's good that you have a relationship with her. Yeah, she's a nice girl. Important. She's very sweet. Very important. Yeah. yeah. She's on your side, I think. I think so. She knows what an egomaniac he is. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. It sounds, it sounds like you've joined forces. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, you know, she doesn't want to get in the middle of it. Of but course. Yeah. A tough spot. Well, ah, oh, look at the kitty. Yeah, here she is. <laughs> so beautiful. What's her name? Lucky. Lucky. How many cats do you have, Betty? Five. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, yeah. they, <laughs> you said cats. that under your breath. Five. <laughs> Are they all indoor cats? Pardon? Are they indoor cats? Indoor, outdoor. They come and go. Yeah. Yeah, mine is just an indoor. Uh, yeah, in New York there. That's a whole different life. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Well, you're certainly I, getting groomed, Betty. I <laughs> yeah. I really adore her. It's true. But I understand now. Boy, when they get old, they get too. They get expensive. I, they they have their needs. And yeah, by, yeah. And by My then, dog you, was... you just love them. Yeah. yeah. So that's how. I it. know. <laughs> how, what, Betty, have you guys had snow? Yes. We had a week of snow, really. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Unusual. We did too. 
Yeah. Yeah. We I we uh, I couldn't get out for a week. <laughs> wow. I know. Of course. Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah, it's still really cold, but I don't think we're supposed to have more snow. Hope not. <laughs> then I then I would think about how Baba kept the Mondelez secluded. And it's like, well, with the pandemic, he's doing it to us and we yeah. didn't ask for it. We are all in seclusion. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank God for, thank God yeah. For Zoom. So we are so, it's like our little secret Zoom. Woo, what a difference it makes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's good to see you, Betty. Absolutely. Hey, good to see you, Paula. I haven't seen you in so long. I know. I dropped out for a while. I kind of was dropped off the planet for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, Baba shifted things. And it's like, well, maybe you better not do that. <laughs> I, it sounds like you getting direct messages from him. I don't get he those. Helps. He well, he, I think you have to pay attention. I mean, really, really close attention. Like sometimes, you know, I find myself hearing people's stories, and I thought, well, my story's not so much. And then I would get jealous and stuff. And then I thought, <laughs> you know, and then I would think about. And I look and I think about, I watch how everybody's got their careers and stuff. I've never known what the hell I'm doing on this planet. <laughs> and <clears throat> except for having kids and trying to raise them. And then that always does blow up in your face somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he he gets us through it he get he he does direct us but it does require really close attention because when i would think about it and i think about how bell says everybody has their share and i would think but i kind of want more but then it's like but baba i i have to be grateful for even having a share mm -hmm. baba's given me a share. so i don't know what my share is but baba gave me a share and and I need to be grateful for what he gave me. And he gave me a lot. Mm -hmm. And he still gives me a lot. You know, what I'm, if you have things going on in your life that are really, this has been really hard for the last year and a half to get through. The last summer, I was nuts. I just kind of went nuts. It's like my mind and my body and my spirit just all got fractured. And I didn't know what the heck was going on. And it took, you know, help from a Chinese doctor and just all of a sudden it's like it finally shifted and it's like my mind and body and spirit kind of got a little bit more back together but it was a big shock and and I think I think I was trying with having Baba I think I was trying to escape the shock and he can't I think that's what I discovered but I still don't know very much about it it, it was very confusing time to go through. Yeah. But now it's like, I mean, and Baba couldn't have told me more clearly that my husband and my son are just fine. They're with him. And it's like, I, I know, Paula, I know you're a mess, but they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's kind of why I dropped out for a while because but I think that we're all just so lucky because we have whatever share we have, we have a share, mm -hmm. you know? Paula, we and miss you. We, we, we want you back. Come come back more often. Come yeah, back. Paula. Yeah. Well, I'm not good at Artie's, you come know? To I, come to Ladies huh? Tea. That's Ladies Tea on Tuesday. You know, I, I know, but there. sometimes I just don't wake up on time. It's okay. Uh, it's, like today I came late, you know, but I thought, oh, and it was a blessing today. It really was. Mm -hmm. to, to, I thought I'll just get on. But yeah, no, it's wonderful. Our Baba groups, are, they're life-saving. They are life-saving. Yeah. 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 It's always yeah. to hear, to have you with us, Paula. Thank you. You're such a, it's a safe place. A human, a human, human. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. But Bob has given us so much. So, and it's just paying attention, you know, yeah. just to know about him. I remember once Irene Holt was, 
was we we were just talking outside because we lived across the street from each other for a while and she says you know just the fact that we know about Nair Baba and somehow we know who he is is just mind-boggling because mm. most of the people in the world don't don't know don't have them and to go through what I went through I've 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 come across more the Baba does this um after Bill died, when I went to India, there were two other women who had lost their husbands. It's like who he puts together. And since Christian died, it's like I've met many people who have lost their children. Oh. And everybody says, if I didn't have one guy, well, I was on my way to the hospital and he was my paramedic, but his, he had lost his daughter when she, she was 12 and it had been two years and he was still really lost. And so I could talk to him, you know, I, I mean, I hope it was Baba talking to him because he was trying to find his way. Um, but Baba does that, you know, it's like he makes connections and, and that's a club. Like we look at each other and say, I belong to this club, but I don't want to belong to it, you know, but we know it's like other people, it's a connection. Baba knows what he's doing. He, he's got the big picture. But Tina, it's just paying attention to the little things, the tiny things. Yeah. 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 I, think it's well, I mean, I've had some experiences, but yeah. I don't hear. I know you have. <laughs> I don't hear a voice telling me what to do. Oh, I, I don't. It's a feeling. If I start to do mm -hmm. something and it begins to feel wrong and it never, you know, and you finally yeah. listen <laughs> and you stop. I know. And it's always the feeling of, I don't know if I'm getting this right. Yeah. I have no clue. <laughs> I'm so used to bumbling around. I don't know. <laughs> I kind of think we, yeah. we kind of all share that experience. Hey, I want to remind you, uh, Jeff is interviewing Angela tomorrow night. Which yeah, I want to hear her story. I read her book a little bit. I didn't read the whole thing. I'm reading it now. What an interesting life that woman has led. Yeah, she has said. Yeah. A lot of those things I don't come to in person because I've got my other son and I just really like to spend time with him. Good for you. That's so important. Yeah. Yeah, but I watch them all. I I watch I watch all the all of that. I watch it on video, and then I want to say something. <laughs> it's like, I know that I know you're asking that question. I know the answer to that question. <laughs> so that's a little frustrating. But I listen. They've helped me so much. Those late night chats and the uh, and and effort and grace. That's, yeah, that's been a big piece much of more yeah. than just reading the book. Yeah. The discussion is yeah. good. Yeah, that, uh, that's gotten me through so much. There's so much information. I got really frustrated because it's like I was trying to, <laughs> it's Baba's grace. And if he wants to do it, he will. But it's like trying to grab more inside myself than I'm capable of holding is what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And I got exhausted and frustrated <laughs> yeah. wow. because it's like, wait a minute, because it's, there's a lot, there's so much to absorb. And Jeff has, I mean, and I get it. I get it while it's going on. Well, my memory's not great anymore. I don't know if it ever was, but anymore, it's really not. <laughs> so I'm, I just, that it all I'm, goes inside. I'm working on a show about Louisa May Alcott, and I'm going to do it on Baba Zoom one of these days. Awesome. Awesome. Huh? Her life was nothing like Little Women. You picked the most interesting people. I, Willa Cather, who knew all that you, and uh, yeah, well, and Anne Frank, of course, or Meep. You have, your shows are fabulous, Tina. They really Well, are. thank you, Betty. And, um, you know, Louisa grew up on a commune. Her father was a hippie radical. And <laughs> he, 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 her commune was a stop on the Underground Railroad. He was an ardent abolitionist. And he was part of a mob that stormed the courthouse in Boston trying to get this captured slave out and a guard was killed. 
Oh, and, wow. and so he was a wanted man. And he went into hiding. I mean, it was. And Louise wow. was thinking of killing herself because they had no money. He wouldn't work. You know, the mother had to get a job. Her sister died of rheumatic fever because the father wouldn't call a doctor. He was giving her homeopathic remedies. Oh I mean, it was just unbelievable. Wow. wow. Oh, you get this sweet sort of, you know, the Hollywood version. <laughs> Yeah, but I think the real story is much more interesting. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Well, I've got to eat lunch before. I've got to go too, ladies. This has been great. It's been like sitting around the, the table at the in the dining hall. At the I know. <laughs> it's it's pretty great. It's Thank you, Baba. <laughs> yeah. nice Thanks, Betty, for everything you do and all the hosting you do and stuff. It's pretty wonderful. It's all pretty yes. wonderful. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. you, Angela. She really, it's her inspiration. Baba, thank you, Baba. Getting us, something. Through, getting us through COVID. Yep. And other things. <laughs> 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 Whatever comes along. <laughs> Day Baba, guys. Yeah, Day Baba, everybody. Okay, I'm going to close and this will end the meeting. So next meeting, it'll, yeah, you'll, you'll start it up. Again. Okay, thank you, Betty. Bye-bye. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Bye -bye. Jay Baba.